A tēnā tātou, a tūtahi kā mihi kā tika kia kingi tu heitia, pō te tau te whero whero te tūwhitu, a rā ko te kingi tanga pai marere ki a a ki a rātou katoa. Huri nō kia tātou, hui hui mai nei i tēnei pō, a i ringi te reo karanga o te pō nei, nau mai, haere mai ki te whare wānanga o Waikato. Tēnā tātou. Ko Sarah Jane te akiwai tōku ingoa, a i tēnei pō, ko ai te kai arahi, a o te kaupapa kōrero. Nā reira, nau mai, haere mai. Tēnā tātou and welcome uh, to this uh, rather strange environment as you would have seen um, with the seating arrangements this evening. It's a first for all of us, so thank you um, for your patience. Tonight's kaupapa, or kaupapa kōrero, uh, as you would have seen, um, is an opportunity for us uh, to consider a topic that's both globally and locally relevant. Um, but what I wanted to do before I um, just introduce the topic more formally is just explain uh, how we're going to run um, the evening. So you'll see our panel, who I'll introduce shortly, uh, they are going to speak um, on their specific kaupapa for uh, about five, roughly five minutes. Um, we do have an opportunity for a question um, and answer time, and really this is an opportunity as the context of kaupapa kōrero uh, and bodies is about an opportunity for you to ask questions of our panel. Uh, and so um, I'm not sure in my notes here it says that um, use of mobile phones is not permitted, actually tonight it is, um, for a specific purpose. Um, I've just learnt how to use it, so if I can use it because I'm technologically deficient, I'm sure you will all be able to. So on the screen at certain points um, during the um, presentations you'll see QR codes. So if you have a smartphone, um, you just point your phone, um, I did it myself so I know it works, um, at the QR code it will take you to the app called Slido uh, and from there you will be able to uh, ask questions. So um, those questions can then, will then be moderated by uh, our Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research, Professor Bryony James. Uh, and once the panel have um, finished speaking, um, then we will be facilitating that question and answer format. Uh, depending on how we go with that process, because again, like the seating, it's a new one for us, uh, and how time goes, we may also have time to um, have questions from the floor, but we'll just see how we go. Uh, we also, as you would see, um, we are a fully female panel uh, this evening, um, which is then an apology from Associate Professor Tom Rua. Uh, unfortunately, he has been um, caught up in Tamaki Makoto, uh, so given traffic and weather, uh, he's tendered his apologies for this evening, um, but hopefully we will be able to engage him at some further point in the future around this kaupapa. One of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter Global Network, Patrice Khan Colors wrote, as human beings, we usually fight for the things that move us out of complacency. We fight for clarity and truth telling. We fight for a world that we want our children to live in, a world we want our communities to thrive in. Black Lives Matter, was founded in 2013 and began as a call to action in response to state-sanctioned violence and anti-black racism on the back of the acquittal of Trayvon Martin's murderer. The murder of George Floyd has refocused attention on the continued violence towards an ongoing state-sanctioned systemic oppression of black lives. The massive rallies and marches held across the globe in turn have forced many countries to confront the uncomfortable truths and histories of their own homelands. In the United States, Indigenous leaders have spoken of the need for Americans to decolonise their minds, noting that the US history of white supremacy has stretched back to Columbus's discovery and subsequent devastation through introduced diseases and forced relocations of thousands of native populations. In Canada, the rallies brought forward the dark realities of Canada's history of racism against Indigenous people and the importance of ending white silence on this history. In Australia, Aboriginal leaders highlighted that the conversation around justice for Indigenous people has been ongoing for more than two centuries, but it took the death of George Floyd in the United States for Australians to begin to open their hearts and minds 
For us here in Aotearoa, these conversations have been just as challenging. Recent events here in Kirikiriroa, including the removal of the Captain Hamilton statue, have again brought to the fore our own uncomfortable histories and the need to have those uncomfortable conversations. As a university, we are a part of that system. But equally, part of our purpose and function is to enable spaces for such uncomfortable conversations to occur. Tonight, we draw inspiration from the words of Patrice Khan Cullors and her desire for us to move out of complacency, to fight for the world where we want our children to live in and the world where we want our communities to thrive. In Te Ao Māori, there is a saying that in order to know where we are going, we first need to know where we have come from. And so tonight, our conversation focuses on acknowledging and challenging privilege, the place of monuments, memorialisation and historical reminders, and the power of language in naming conventions as part of reclaiming ownership. Nā reira, uh, e raurangatira mā, nō mai ki te kaupapa kōrero. I'd like to take this opportunity now to introduce our first speaker, uh, Kyla Campbell Kamarira, who is the Waikato Student Union uh, President for 2020. Tēnā tātou. If we're talking about engaging with Black Lives Matter and kaupapa of the same likeness here in Aotearoa, I think a serious part of this conversation is the resistance that occurs in engaging with these kaupapa. If we think of one of the key purposes of Black Lives Matter, it is anti-racist advocacy, and that has everything to do with the world. So yes, every part of this conversation needs to address engagement because we need to be engaging and active in the discourse. But we need to shed equal light on the resistance that, it, that occurs in conjunction. I want to focus this kōrero on self-determination, because I think this is what binds our Ground Zero kaupapa together across the world. No matter the people and no matter the place, there is politics at play. But what occurs that stands in the way of self-determination is the resistance of people who are comfortable living in a colonial settler fairy tale that enforce their ideals, their philosophies, their versions of history, and their version of what is acceptable and not. In a way, we're all engaging in versions of Black Lives Matter movement, but at varied levels of understanding, of knowledge, of action, experience, inexperience, and ignorance. Readjusting the focus to self-determination in an Aotearoa New Zealand context, we can't look past Te Tiriti o Waitangi, the original passport that allows non-Māori to even be here. Which brings me to a question. What would the world look like if all native treaties were upheld. Not if colonisation didn't happen, but if treaties were upheld. I think we'd be having a significantly different conversation here tonight in regards to naming rights and memorialisation. Thinking about our own tiriti and its principles, we're having this conversation because its principles have not been upheld. The rules of engagement have been determined by colonial systems of oppression for too long, and no degree, no profession, no salary needed to have taught me that. It's within every Māori experience that resistance has been and continues to be an obstacle that stops Māori from achieving tino rangatiratanga. There are those who resist Māori achieving personal self-determination, and Māori who resist being marginalised. The analogy of the double-edged sword can be inserted here. Te iwi Māori have a history and tradition of resistance in the pursuit of protecting our mana motuhake, our taonga, our futures and our lives. <laughs> 
Resistance is liberating, but how long is enough? Racial power imbalances are inherent in our country when we are supposed to be in partnership, participation, and protection together. Current hegemonic practices of westernization doesn't allow any of the treaty principles to be upheld. This is evidenced by the development of a number of counter strategies throughout the generations that are more reflective of, appropriate and applicable to the Māori agenda. In modern day warfare, these have been our weapons against the system. Tahimi Henare once said that it is preposterous that any Māori should aspire to become a poor Pākehā when their true destiny prescribed by the Creator is to become a great Māori. Like black, indigenous and people of colour across the world, we have ancestral legacies to uphold. We have our own stories of people, place and politics. Don't resist us. By honouring the treaty, we are bringing you with us. The message I want to share with you all tonight is that Black Lives Matter principles are totally applicable to our experience here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Our support of international kaupapa like Black Lives Matter sends a message to our citizens, our government, our nation, the world, that collectivised self-determination shall not be defeated. And if we're willing to support a kaupapa thousands of kilometres away, then damn sure we won't give up addressing the inequity, racism and injustice faced by tangata whenua here on our own whenua. By supporting kaupapa like Black Lives Matter and amplifying their voices, the echoes won't fade out in our South Pacific safe haven. Our kaupapa in Aotearoa demand the same energy as we're putting into Black Lives Matter. We're multifaceted people. Although our feet may stand firmly on our whenua, our wairua transcends beyond places we can't even fathom. It's not a one or the other thing. Our belief in our being tells us what we're capable of. Kia ora. Nga mihi kaila. Um, so just for those of you around the QR code or the um, app, um, please you can begin typing your questions now um, while you're thinking about them and while Kyla's presentation is fresh in your mind. Um, I'd like now to introduce our next speaker, uh, Sandra Lee Ringham, uh, up to the podium. Tēnā kui. Kia ora everyone. Um, not many people call me Sandra Lee, only my mother when I'm really misbehaving. Um, but anyway, um, I just want to take some time to acknowledge uh, Ngāti Wairere and Waikato Tainui and the land on which we stand today. I'm honoured to be here. I'm a teaching fellow and a doctoral student here at Waikato, and I also work for my iwi Ngāti Kuri in building uh, working partnerships with science within science and research institutions. In that work, I bring our people together with I bring our people together with scientists to exchange knowledge um, and co-author the naming of seaweed, newly found seaweed. And today really is an opportunity for us to engage in a conversation that is exciting and hopeful for some, and yet confronting and uncomfortable for others. It's a conversation that must be had. Today I will tell two stories. I touch on my recent personal experience and as well as my experience as an academic in publishing scientific article naming a new seaweed. Both expose the underbelly of racism while also highlighting the importance of naming our world. I begin with my personal story and I wrote this while I was working on my PhD. My mind and my pen kept coming back to George, George Floyd. So I wrote about my experience in conversations with old friends around Black Lives Matter, the removal of colonial statues, 
and the suggested name changes in Aotearoa. And this is what I wrote. Racism is a daily reality in my social circles. I pride myself on the fact that I have maintained my, the friendships from my childhood, from my, from my hometown. I believe these relationships were deep, based on love, acceptance and kindness, and I quickly found out I was wrong. I find myself bombarded with by racist comments on Facebook posted by people I called friends, people I'd known my entire life. My so-called friends were spouting white lives matter, all lives matter, as black people, people of colour and indigenous died and cried and acted out in pain and anger. They complain about the proposed name changes at pubs and spew racist comments. They insist name changes will and removed statues won't change anything. Perhaps it is their fear that it will change everything um, that makes them stamp their feet like a spoiled racist child. My heart aches and my anger rages as I revisit the racist racism of my hometown. I cared about these people, so for a short while I spent time explaining, teaching, sharing my personal, my tribal, my whānau experiences. I was met with, change is hard. Given a, my people suffered too, example, told to move on. Asked, won't the treaty become null and void if we decolonise? What hope in hell did I have in creating a space for Māori naming in science if there was no space for me and the lives of my friends? Easy answer, ditch those people with racist minds. They are not my friends. Done. The more complex task is to identify allies and people whose minds are open and kind in the process of doing. Let's just say my Facebook friend list is dwindling really quickly these days. It's shrinking as we speak. Um, naming people, the naming of people, place and our physical, material and metaphysical world reflects the political will of society and institutions. A discussion on the social and political power to name our world is often excluded by those who make the rules to name it. As I mentioned earlier, Ngāti Kuri are engaging in the naming of new seaweeds. One challenge we've faced is in the publishing of an article discussing a newly named seaweed. We had co-authored both the article and the taxon of that seaweed, Te Kurawai or Te Manawatafi. Our article did a great job of naming and describing the species under the scientific regulations and standards, but articulating Māori language, context and content was questioned and reject, rejected quickly by the editor who refused to send it on for a peer review. The editor argued that the article contained excessive te, te reo Māori. There was a total of nine Māori words, hardly excessive. The editor reasoned that the international scientific community would struggle with the language and not be interested in the social and political will of Ngāti Kuri to name their world. The editor questioned how acknowledging Ngāti Kuri as kaitiaki is relevant to taxonomy. In the context of the treaty, and with the increasing international emphasis on incorporation um, indigenous and local knowledge, all scientists need to be aware of the con cultural context in which they are working and thinking. To cut a long story short, we pulled the article and it was published last year in a Canadian scientific journal. While Ngāti Kuri and our scientific partners grapple with, the co with negotiating co-authorship and, and there are positive outcomes, participation and engagement make space for Indigenous co-authorship and um, publication, ac academic publications, while also deepening knowledge, connections, relationships between people, place and politics. The point I make is, the, is resistance, resistance sits within the institutions in which we exist. We must identify who allies are and who and where resistance to change sits. 
both in our personal lives and within the academy. Naming our world is central to the Indigenous movement towards further decolonisation. And I just want to finish with, by coming back to the piece I wrote while thinking about George Floyd and the racism of my friends, because it relates quite deeply to my academic experience as well. I cry tears on my mother's shoulder as I scream. I just want to punch them in the throat. The emotions, the rage and the mouth are hard to control. She calms me. She holds me. She tells me I have outgrown them. Their minds are small. They are uneducated. You have important work to do and you must do it graciously. I understand that my pain is also hers. And I use this as a reminder and as a source of determination to write out systemic institutional processes of naming. Kia ora. Tēnā koe Sandy, nei te whakatika i tō ingoa, i mua i a tātou katoa i tēnei pō. Our final panellist tonight is Professor Robin Longhurst. Tēnā koe Robin. I would just like to say at the outset that it's a real privilege sharing the stage tonight with these amazing uh, three wahine here. Um, as Sarah said in her introduction, of course, the Black Lives Matter movement, while we know it has its roots in the US, it's prompted protest across many parts of the world and including uh, here in Aotearoa. So one of the topics, as you all know, that's been prompting a lot of dissension has been statues, and um, the, the statues have already been mentioned this evening. Statues are a way of memorialising the past, and of course pasts often built on slavery, colonisation and racism. They aren't just backdrops to daily life, but they're intended to commemorate what societies value. In the Black Lives Matter movement, since the tragic killing of George Floyd on the 25th of May, has helped cast light on many statues around the world, and so I want to take the opportunity this evening to reflect on a couple in Kirikiriroa. But actually not just those that memorialise colonisation. Statues reflect power relations across numerous axes of power, so race and colonisation are very important ones for this evening but also class, gender, and sexuality. So I want to start by focusing on a statue that actually resists dominant power relations, and that is riffraff, which many of you will be familiar with. The riffraff statue in Victoria Street celebrates the iconic riffraff character from the time-warping alien from the planet transsexual from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And, as many of you will know, of course, it stands on the now-demolished Embassy Theatre site where Richard O'Brien, who played Riff Raff in the movie, used to spend time. So Riff Raff is not the norm, as far as statues go. And when a colleague and I finished a book manuscript on how sexuality affects the way people interact with place, we asked our US-based editor if we could have Hamilton's own Riff Raff statue on the cover. She wasn't entirely convinced about that, but we eventually got her over the line. So another statue or monument, though, that also conveys a theme of sexual difference is the Gay Liberation Monument in a park close to Stonewall Inn, which is a gay club in Greenwich Village in New York. So in 1969, an uprising took place in, when police violently raided the bar and patrons fought back. The uprisings widely considered to constitute one of the most important events leading to the gay liberation movement in the, in the US. And the Gay Liberation Monument, completed in 1980, features two gay men and two lesbians. So the bronze statues are covered in white lacquer. But in 2015, prompted by Black Lives Matter activists, um, they paint, there was the painting of these two figures' faces brown to protest the way the statues, what the activists called whitewasher movement. So they argue that this was actually a movement led by black and brown, queer and trans people 
So they painted the statues brown and dressed them in wigs and bright costumes. So statues are often contested, which brings me back to recent events in Kirikiriroa. So as many of you know, of course, on the 25th of June, a crane hoisted a bronze sculpture of Captain Hamilton from Civic Square after threats from local Māori and anti-racism protesters to topple it. The controversial statue was donated to the council in 2013, and Mayor Paula Southgate has said, and I quote, I know many people find the statue personally and culturally offensive. We can't ignore what is happening all over the world, and nor should we. But another statue that's received less attention in Kirikiriroa is the family, it's the farming family, which is donated by Sir Bob Jones. It was unveiled in 1990 at the southern junction of Ulster and Victoria Streets, and it depicts a so-called ordinary uh, farming family. It consists of a life-size figure of a man, a woman, two children, a dog, a cow, and a sheep. And the statue is intended to celebrate the role of the farming family in history. But it sparked some controversy a few years ago for showing, in fact, a very Eurocentric history of the Waikato. So, all landscapes reflect these power relations of gender and sexuality, class, but also, and of course key to tonight's panel discussion, ethnicity, race, racism and colonisation. So we all interpret landscapes every day. We, we look at tagging on walls, manicured lawns, signs on shops, and they convey to us these impressions of poverty or wealth, of diversity or homogeneity, but also feelings of whether we belong or don't belong somewhere. And so the question is really, what should we do with existing statues? We can create new ones in our future, and a colleague had suggested to me that maybe we could have one of the anti-Springbok protesters who'd blocked the Hamilton rugby match in 1981. But what about those existing statues? They're statues of old, statues of slave traders, of colonizers, of farming families. Should they be removed, painted, beheaded, toppled? Or perhaps as Tuhoi Māori activist Tama Iti once suggested, all placed together where people can talk about them like a racist museum. <laughs> Recently, Professor Paul Spoonley commented, Public statues and monuments should be kept so people can be reminded about the good and bad events of New Zealand history. But I'm actually not so sure that there's a one-size-fits-all answer to my question. The Black Lives Matter movement illustrates, well to me at least, that there are many people who don't want to be continually reminded of the bad events of history. There are enough effects of racism and colonisation in people's lives serving as daily reminders. So actually, to return to Mayor Southgate again, she also recently commented that we need to have these brave and honest discussions about the past, something again Sarah mentioned in her introduction, and I agree. So each monument, its specific context, the communities of people it stands amongst, needs to be thought about carefully we need to have courageous conversations, each from our different embodied uh, positions. So just by way of an example, a few months ago in the US, the Library of Virginia held what it called a civic conversation about monuments. It was free, open to the public, and part of a small group discussion series encouraging informed conversations around complex topics affecting the state of Virginia. So every two weeks, the library screens a segment from a documentary film, followed by a roundtable conversation with input from a moderator and a historical expert from the library. So people who go along are encouraged to share their perspectives with the group. And I offer this actually just as, as one very small example of one of the many steps we could take to help support freedom, liberation, justice, these all being very important cornerstones, of course, of the Black Lives Matter movement. Kilda. Yeah. 
Kia ora, thank you Robin. Um, that concludes our panel um, session and what we have is um, still a small window of opportunity for you to submit your questions um, via Slido or using the QR code uh, and that will stay open until I walk back to my chair. Um, so type quick those of you who have a burning question uh, and once I um, sit down we'll begin um, reading through uh, the questions that have been posed to the panel by yourselves this evening. Kia ora. I didn't walk very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so I hope you typed fast. Um, but hopefully that also gave an opportunity for the transition um, in terms of our, our mics, so I can hear that they're working. Um, so the way that this works is that uh, I'll read the questions um, that you've put forward, and some of them have been posed uh, to direct members of the panel, and others are more um, general questions. So if I could just start actually with you, Kyla, uh, as a question, what does being an ally look like? Um, what would your advice be? And perhaps start with Kyla, but I think actually all the panel would be useful to answer that. What does an ally look like? What does an ally look like? Oh, that's tough. Um, an ally looks like they, they are actively um, seeking education, um, having conversations, but also removing themselves from the spotlight and leading those conversations um, and just really learning about um, the people that they're trying to be allies with. Um, if, if you want to be an ally of my Māori self, then you're pronouncing kupu Māori correctly, um, you're pronouncing my names correctly and um, we're having uncomfortable conversations naturally um, for the purpose of making the world a better place um, for all people alike, not just indigenous and non-Māori, but just for the human experience. Um, to me, I think an ally looks like somebody who listens. I think there's a lot of noise going on in the world right now um, and not a lot of people are listening. And in the conversations that I have with my friends and some colleagues, they often speak over me when I'm trying to tell my story. So listening to me um, is really important. But also, I think an ally looks like somebody who steps back off that platform and invites you onto the stage um, to speak your stories, uh, your kaupapa, and your, your desires. So yeah, to me, it looks like somebody who steps back and listens with their heart and their soul, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what I can add to um, the wisdom already here beside me, but I, I, I would certainly agree with all of those comments. I think for me, from a position of whiteness in supporting, for example, a movement like Black Lives Matter, it's about very much, Sandy, about, about listening, um, about learning, about um, being prepared to make oneself vulnerable, about um, uh, not always thinking one can step up and know and lead, uh, but actually just at times taking a back seat and being prepared again to be vulnerable, to be directed by others. Thank you. Um, perhaps a follow-up question, um, again, on being a Pākehā ally um, specifically, and the question around how Māori can support Pākehā to be better allies. Mm, tricky. Is it the really our work to do that? You know, that's what I think. I think we've, we've lived in a world where we've kind of um, had to adjust and... and navigate a Pākehā world for so long that perhaps this is work that needs to be done by Pākehā, for Pākehā, but also for Māori. So in my mind, I, I actually, you know, I'm not sure it's, it's really our work to do. We've been doing it long enough. Um, how Māori can support Pākehā to become allies, I think it's really hard because um, we're trying to seek our own self-determination and have, and have an equitable platform as Pākehā, um, as Pākehā do 
or on non Māori um, in general. And so it's something that um, I've experienced, you know, helping along my non Māori colleagues or friends um, in the university space. But I think the beautiful thing about being in the university space is that um, it doesn't have to be a self responsibility thing all the time. We're having these types of kaupapa corridor. So um, my role then might turn to inviting people to listen to these conversations. Um, so I don't think that it has to become um, the, the onus is on you personally um, because that is the emotional trauma that comes with that is really difficult to manage at the same time. Um, but I think overall this question has um, sown the seed in my mind um, to think more about how, if I'm asking non-Māori to not resist us, how am I showing them that they're open um, and come, um, free to come to our spaces as well? Um, so I think this question is more of a, a, an afterthought for me um, and, and the mahi that I intend to do into the future. <clears throat> Robin, perhaps if we start with you with this question, um, why do you think we, uh, we being typical Pākehā people, um, can relate to the issues in the USA, for example, Black Lives Matter and George Floyd, uh, while not seeing the parallel issues here in New Zealand? How can we relate to them while not seeing yeah, How can we relate to what's happening in the States, um, but not see the parallel issues here in Aotearoa, New Zealand? I, I would have... I would hope that most people in um, seeing what's going on in the United States with the Black Lives Matter movement would be able to see and relate and understand that there are very important uh, parallels within the kind of power relations that exist in Aotearoa. Um, perhaps there are people who don't see that, but um, I would think that being able to um, take what we're seeing in the US, take what we're seeing in other countries around the world and to filter that through into our own local context. And it's, it's the geographer in me, Sandy, and in you too, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and we do tend to think about the world in terms of scales uh, from local through to you know, the, the cities and regional and national and international and so on. And I would have thought that those threads run all the way through. Um, I just want to focus a little bit um, around the concept of resistance and um, particularly around the, the statement around resistance being found everywhere. So how do we work around it in terms of our naming practices and conventions? Maybe we could start again with you. The question of resistance. The question of resistance um, being found everywhere. So. How do we work around it in terms of our naming practices? Yeah, I, I don't. I, I think that's right. Actually, resi resistance is found everywhere, but it's a it's an enormously complex concept because it sits in relation to domination and kind of not not in a simplistic binary. But wherever you have relations of power and dominance, you you have resistance to that, um, and that resistance can happen again, right? Sort of at, at localized levels from the ground up to quite globalised kinds of resistance. So I think we have to seize all of those opportunities to recognise resistance, celebrate resistance, um, and know that it, it is happening all around us. So there's a, um, there's a thinker that some of you in the room might be aware of, a, a, actually a French philosopher, uh, Michel Foucault, and he's done a lot of work on this idea of resistance. He says that power isn't just um, some kind of simplistic relationship between a dominant par party and someone who resists. Power kind of works much more in a circular relationship. It, it threads its way through much more in a web-like kind of a way. And therefore that means that no matter how hopeless it might feel at times, there is actually always capacity there for resistance. Even if that's at the most simplistic level, you might feel completely overwhelmed by someone and unable to speak back to them, but they might turn their back and you might poke your tongue out at them. That's resistance. You know, and we, but we need to seize that and, and hold on to that. 
Um, I sort of also see resistance in our institutions and particularly in our naming processes. Um, you know, resistance to change, resistance to evolve, and resisting um, sharing power. Um, I'm not sure what I'm getting at right now, but so, so I think resistance is, is a really interesting concept. Um, there's those of us who resist um, uh, inequalities and marginalisation, but then resistance also sits within these institutions when it comes to sharing that platform and that space to name our world. Um, so in my mind, I'm thinking, um, how can we change that? How can we make naming processes more accessible to people? And I think it's around um, and being more flexible in those rules of naming. You know, we had an interesting um, experience through the naming of that uh, Te Korawai or Te Manawafa, uh, Manawatafi. Um, and we named that collectively. So like usually a scientist's name will go on the end of a taxon and that will sort of say who discovered it and who holds the knowledge around it. And with our engagement with that, we kind of went, well, we don't want to put our individual names on it. We want to put our tribal name on it. So we named the entire tribe. And that was something that hasn't been done very often. And so, in actual fact, through engaging in naming seaweeds, we're sort of reshaping the rules and the way that our, our flora and fauna is named. And so in some forms, we're resisting the rules, and in some forms, there has been some resistance to us reshaping those rules. So, yeah, interesting question. Um, a situation comes to mind, and we're talking about the Black Lives Matter movement, and it's at its peak in the States at the moment. Um, and if we hear stories of what's happening, and it's happening here in Aotearoa um, at a different scale, but the resistance is in the fact that you can, uh, every day New Zealander can highlight the inequity and the racism and the injustice that's happening in the States because you're not, physically required to be there and to be active. Um, and so resistance is being seen, can be seen as, um, in an Aotearoa context, you can see that, but you're not willing to put yourself physically in that space to address that racism and inequity and inequality and injustice. And um, that was some of the corridor that I was hoping to touch on in my five minutes. Um, and that's precisely why we are having this discussion. Um, but like I say, resistance is liberating as well. Um, we've had some of our greatest wins as Māori dim, for Māori dim, um, as a result of resistance, Māori language petition, uh, kura kaupapa, kōhanga reo movements. Um, but we're still being resisted by the treaty not being honoured. Um, and we can have a discussion about the treaty if, if there's um, questions that have come through. Um, but, uh, but if I um, lead off from that statement that I just made, um, resistance is systemically, um, is, a, is a systemic obstacle that, um, doesn't allow Māori to be self-governing um, and in partnership with not even just Pākehā, but the people that make the rules and make the decisions. Um, and that's a wider conversation that, that shouldn't take away from the Black Lives Matter movement, but is equally, um, we, we can see that those same uh, daru, th the core source of uh, the whawhai over in the States exist here in Aotearoa too. Um, and so we, we can't be blind to the fact um, that it does happen here, um, but be so woke to what's happening across the world. Mm. So there's two, two parts, I guess. Um, so it's a great segue actually into the, the question around treaties and the need for treaties to be upheld, or the question is around treaties or statement, treaties are supposed to be upheld. 
um, particularly um, a reference to the UNDRIP or United Nations Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, so why do you think, well I, I guess you've already mentioned um, your thoughts about, in some respects, about why treaties are not being um, honoured. Uh, do you have any additional thoughts and perhaps also open to the panel? around um, why they aren't, and more specifically, what are we doing? Um, perhaps not just us as Indigenous people, but us as a nation, uh, around honouring of those treaties. Mm. I think if we were to talk about our own tiriti, or waitangi, um, and the principles of partnership, participation and protection, um, straight away my mind goes to protection is not being upheld if our children are still being uplifted by state care and being abused in those systems. That's not protection. Um, participation is not having seven Māori seats of 120 seats in our House of Representatives. Um, and those are small, those are few, but massive examples as to why um, Te Tiriti o Waitangi is not even being upheld. Um, I think uh, Tiriti is not being upheld because, you know, the powers that be don't want to share the power. You know, I really fully agree with what you said. And, and you know, when, when it comes to sharing power um, from a dominant um, society, that's also about losing power. And I think that is a, a, is a huge... Um, barrier to, to actually honouring the treaty in its full um, capacity. So yeah, that, that's about all I'd like, because what you said was so eloquent and great. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's challenging to move from the status quo. It's, um, usually in life it's not revolutions that do that, it's bit by bit by bit, and it, it, does, it does feel like there's a lot of chipping away that happens at the hegemony or those sort of hegemonic power relations that takes often a lot, a lot of years. And then you can feel as though there's been um, a gaining of ground and then a, a kind of slipping back again uh, into those, um, the, the hegemony again. So I, I think it's a, it's a challenge. There's no one reason why, if we, if we could point to that, it would be much easier, but it's so multifaceted as to why Power works across so many different axes. We're, we're talking about politics here around tonight, about around slavery and colonisation and race and ethnicity. But um, of course, it, we're all human beings that are. We're also we're gendered. We have certain sexualities. We, you know, on on and on it goes. Certain body shapes. Certain and, and some of these um, afford us with certain privileges in life. And other axes of identity mean that we have less privilege in other other spaces and other aspects, so it's certainly enormously complex. Mm. I guess picking up on that um, notion of complexity and the, the multifaceted nature of our lives, um, but also more around the privileging of voices, um, one question is around the role of mainstream media and how, um, well I guess the question is, has mainstream media been or contributed to um, this issue around privileging of certain voices over others? And then what is the alternative, I guess, would be my follow-up. How do we um, work to rewrite, well, not so much to rewrite, but to provide the space for other voices to come through? Well, I, I, I can start, but absolutely many mainstream media certainly upheld the power relations that are in place. And um, I, I think that it, it's enormously important that we keep thinking about that and challenging that because those sort of more traditional mainstream or um, media um, outlets, they don't just reflect what's going on, they play an active role in shaping what's going on. So in other words, you can't separate out what's sometimes called the discourse or the representation or the discursive from the real, from those actions, that lived experience, the on the ground. Those two things are intimately connected. So I think one way in which we can um, try and address that is by having 
multiple voices, as many voices as we can, from many different positions, so that we end up having the brave, the courageous, the difficult conversations, not just one dominant line that we keep getting through over and over again. So. Mm, I agree with that, especially around the um, dominant voice of the media. It actually can be a, um, a really dangerous place, an unsafe place to sort of be reading and, and stuff. And I think there's, there's, there's also um, the capacity for people to, to invent news and to invent discourse and, and, and sort of really um, put their opinions out there in the public space a lot more today. And in some ways that is um, their voices, if they belong to the dominant society, then that gets more traction and on we go and, and, and yeah, on we go. And I think that one way to resolve that is to make space for, for the less dominant people to actually be heard in our, um, you know, in Māori TV and in our, in our news and in our media. Mm. I don't have much more to add to those for Karo, but um, my line of thinking is that um, in mainstream sh channels we do have Māori programs and, and Pacific programs, but they're not at prime time viewing. Um, and so is that good enough? Um, is it good enough that our news presenters say Kia ora, New Zealand and, and that's it, but the, but the news that they're reporting on is specifically for an audience um, when it's not current affairs, it's specifically for an audience um, that um, they don't want to have the uncomfortable conversations, so they won't give the uncomfortable conversations um, that we should be reporting on in um, our, our biggest um, sort of media sector, um, and that's an avenue of having those conversations. And so those are, yeah, that's my whakaro. But, um, you know, recently we've had the Māori media shift um, mandated from a government level. And so that's, that's a prime example of the marginalisation of Māori voices to shift those programmes that we finally do have on, on mainstream channels, um, shifting them and marginalising them to Channel 19 um, where you have the power and capacity to view that content if you want to. Um, and and that's, not, that's not equity, mm. I don't think. Um, I want to, um, there are a couple of questions which are very similar, so um, I'll kind of rephrase them. Um, and they're both forward-thinking questions. Um, so for all of the panel, how can Pākehā Māori and other members of our community here in Hamilton work together to create a safer and more supportive um, city in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I think probably more about, if you had the opportunity, um, what would that vision uh, of our future look like? I think um, having the uncomfortable conversations without having the fear of being punished for having conversations and, and dredging up conversations that need to be had um, or 180 year long conversations that needed to, need to be um, had. And so I think um, the biggest punishment is violence um, and it's marginalisation of Māori voices. Um, we've had commentary lately from people that say that they won't hire Māori people um, as their employees and so um, violence can be seen in many ways and can be experienced in many ways um, and, and it's violence um, by bringing up trauma, uh, violence by punishing people for being who they are, violence uh, upon people who are just trying to make the human experience better by having uncomfortable conversations but are being punished for it because of the resistance that is happening daily. I think for me the vision for the future would be really about um, having, holding, um, practicing true partnership 
uh, a true treaty partnership and, and seeing um, Maori faces, Maori voices, uh, Maori participation across the board politically um, and environmental management and so forth and, and just having a more balanced um, shared power across our spaces. Yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree, Sandy. I think those, again, those concepts of the um, so integral to the Black Lives Matter movement and justice and equity and um, I, th I think having, having a more equitable society across all of those areas, education, health, um, justice system, would be a huge start towards having a society in which everybody felt uh, much more valued than perhaps many people do now. Um, how we get there, <laughs> how we get there is the daily, the daily struggle. But a society where we didn't have a huge disparity in wealth and all of the different outcomes, political, social, economic and so on, I think would be my, where I would want to, I'd want to head in the future. Thank you. Um, just for our audience, um, before I bring this session to a close, um, for those of you who may be asking why these panellists, um, Kaupapa Kōrero is an opportunity for the university to present to our community, um, including our university community, but uh, beyond our university community, um, some of our students and researchers and academics uh, who have been working in this space or who are studying in this space. And so our panellists tonight, which would have included Associate Professor Tom Doerr, uh, are all, as you would have heard, uh, active in this space and have been for some time. So uh, if you could, I would like uh, you to join me in thanking our panel members. Um, for <laughs>